brief introduction before we get started with the presentation. Before you hear anything important. Uh, uh, in uh, August and September of this year, we were lucky enough to uh, become involved with the Camp Bird Project and uh, took over operating control there uh, from the previous owner. Um, and uh, it's been a, uh, uh, an incredible experience for us, for me personally. Um, I think what I'd like to share with you just is a little bit how we um, are thinking and, and we feel like we, uh, we want to, to some extent, be a rather innovative company in the mining sector. Uh, our goals are really to um, reach out in many respects to uh, uh, environmental groups. We are very fortunate at the Camp Bird and uh, we have uh, clean water, we have uh, no real environmental issues or problems and uh, we consider ourselves very, very fortunate and very lucky for that. And it doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to help clean up areas that uh, might have been uh, uh, from a water perspective or from other perspectives may not be so fortunate. Uh, I think Bob Oswald's speak was, speech was very good here. Mining in many respects has built many of the cities here and has been responsible for a lot of wealth generated it's also done some things that uh, aren't as good. Um, to, to my mind, and uh, uh, I think our philosophy is going to be that we're going to operate in a way that uh, uh, works with both environmental groups and with the government agencies to reach out and uh, try to clean some of these up. I know. Um, we also heard a little bit about the uh, Good Samaritan Act and some of these other uh, things that are coming on uh, from the congressional side. Uh, if they come on at all, uh, we are very, very uh, uh, encouraging of these particular initiatives. Uh, we've taken on three projects so far with the Uncompagre Water Partnership. and. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Mike speak a little bit more in detail about those, but I think uh, from a fundamental point of view, we are going to be a very aggressive company in terms of, to some extent, I, I know some people in here don't like me to say this, but paying for the sins of the past, uh, whether they were in Colorado or California or wherever these things have been. Mining doesn't have a perfect history, neither does the automotive industry, neither does any other industry. And uh, we want to be part of cleaning up the mining industry, and we want to be part of cleaning that up here locally in the San Juans. So with that said, I think uh, that is our fundamental uh, uh, stewardship here in the environmental side. And it's going to be one of our most important uh, things that we're going to be doing going forward. So I think I'll let Mike tell you a lot more of the details of the camper. <clears throat> okay, this, uh, let me see if I'm going to read it. This diagram here kind of shows the camper in its current configuration with the 14 level equivalent. Uh, at the surface and then the 11,000 foot long tunnel that reaches the camper main that runs east and west. And then the three level portal here that accesses some of the upper workings. So that's just kind of a neat little configuration that uh, is pretty relevant. <clears throat> uh, basically going to go over briefly the geology, uh, the production history, and kind of give a introduction to Caldera Mineral Resources which John uh, just did, and then we'll talk about uh, the short-term and long-term plans of Caldera with respect to the camper. Uh, and by the way, this is a, uh, I don't know if we can get that light to, to dim a little bit, but this is a bug in the uh, camper vein 
Each one of those quartz crystals is about four inches wide, so that's pretty cool. <clears throat> uh, so to kind of dive into the geology, uh, there's just for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to go over two distinct geological events. One is the structural development of the fault, um, Camper Fault, which eventually uh, turned into Camper Vein, as well as mineralization. And there are basically two separate times uh, that those occurred. Um, <clears throat> Again, if we could maybe get the light to dim a little bit, you can see this is a large vein, or fairly significant vein of gold in uh, some of the uh, more uh, impressive specimens from mine. <clears throat> so to get a feel for sort of the structural context where we're at, uh, we've got the San Juans here. This is the San Juan Mountain, and the San Juan Volcanic Field uh, is represented by this uh, irregular tan-colored polygon. And it uh, basically encompasses 24 major pyroclastic sheets deposited over western Colorado. And within that, uh, those sheets were sourced from 18 separate calderas uh, <clears throat> during the course of about a 10 million year period, between 33 and 23 million years ago. So what I'm going to do now is we're just going to focus on this particular region. You see Silverton's delineated here, Lake City would be about right there. <clears throat> uh, so 32 million years ago we had uh, widespread stratovolcanoes in western Colorado, uh, southwestern Colorado, and we also had a number of intrusives, the Stony Mountain intrusive over by uh, uh, Mount Sneffels was partially uh, uh, intruding at that period of time. And as a result of these stratovolcanoes we had a large sheet that we call the San Juan Formation, basically just covered the entire region. So I'm going to talk about this volcanic stratigraphy also, so we have a context a little bit uh, later on. Uh, <clears throat> 28 million years ago, we had basically in the same region the collapse and resurgence of two calderas that more or less erupted simultaneously. The Capire Caldera, which is uh, basically rims out right at Lake City and the San Juan Caldera, which encompasses Silverton. <coughs> the uh, volcanic deposits associated with this eruption we refer to as the uh, Silverton Volcanic Series, as well as the ash flow, or the, the, the very voluminous ash flow tuff that uh, we call uh, the Sapinero Mesa tuff. Uh, following that, about a million years later, we had the collapse of the Silverton Caldera, and uh, basically it kind of encompassed the San Juan to a certain extent towards the southwest. And as a result, we have a very high fracture density in the bedrock surrounding these calderas. And uh, with that fracture density comes mineralization. <clears throat> so this is a zoom in of this particular area, the Silverton Caldera. We're going to zoom in and look at some of the more detailed fractures. Um, between 23 and 22 million years ago, uh, stresses related to the Red Mountain intrusives, which would be about right here, and the Stony Stock, which was still developing at that time, as well as just prior to that, the collapse of the Silverton Caldera, we got a series of uh, long parallel northwest trending faults, which is referred to as the Sinaple Sag. <clears throat> What's Apparent in this is that we have a very discordant east-west vein that cuts most of those northwest faults, and that's actually Camp Erd Fault. Um, on the Uray side, we refer to it as a Camp Erd Fault. On the Telluride side, it's referred to as the Pandora. But it's essentially the same structure. <clears throat> uh, the discordant orientation of that suggests that uh, it's obviously maybe Initially, it uh, was formed prior to the Northwest Faults, and the curved curve structure kind of lending into the Silverton Caldera kind of gives you a feel of maybe it's a early rim fracture of a failed caldera, and that's just kind of geological arm waving. Um, don't really have anything to back that up. But if you see this rim, these rim fractures around the Silverton Caldera, uh, typically, though, in a caldera system, those rim fractures develop early on, and as it collapses, as it collapses, they get more pronounced. 
And so this is a potential that, you know, you have the Silverton and the San Juan, that a potential another one was developing here. <clears throat> um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit just to kind of get an idea for the timing of movement of the fault in the structures. So we're going to highlight it in this yellow box here and go to a more detailed geologic map. <coughs> uh, the Camper Fault is pretty difficult to read on the, on the wall there, but it's basically represented with this red line right there. And those northwest trading structures are right there. The three level of the camper, if you, if you recall from the diagram in the first slide, is located about right there. And the 14 level, uh, where most of the surface infrastructure is towards the ceiling off the map. Uh, the Idorado veins, but uh, or the veins that were mined as, uh, through the Idorado uh, workings, are basically right here at the uh, Argentine Montana and uh, a number of other veins of black bear and things like that that uh, extend towards Red Mountain. Um, the only reason I'm really highlighting this slide is to kind of get an idea for timing of movement. If you look over towards the east, we have northwest faults that are displacing the Camp Bird Fault, so that would suggest that the Camp Bird Fault occurred prior to those northwest faults developing. <coughs> However, if you look at the Argentine Montana and the Smuggler Union and uh, a few other veins, they're offset by the Camp Bird, which suggests that the Northwest Faults occurred prior to the Camp Bird. So you basically have, uh, you know, conflicting evidence as far as the timing goes. But uh, basically, what you can conclude is you have multiple periods of movement with the Camp Bird. So hypothetically, you could have movement related to uh, the uh, early Caldera formation, and uh, <clears throat> that whoops and that would be offset here, and then you have later movement that offset the, the later faults that developed. <clears throat> uh, so we'll move on here, we'll talk about mineralization. So at 26, 27.6 million years ago when the Silverton Caldera collapsed, you know, when most of these structures were developed, they were essentially barren, you didn't have any mineralization. And the first mineralization that we see uh, in the Northwest Faults is actually in the Argentine, Montana, at 17 million years ago, so actually 10 million years after uh, the faults developed, <clears throat> suggesting a significantly different source than the magma plume associated with the caldera. Uh, 17 to 13 million years ago, we also have a deposition of what we call replacement ore adjacent to the Argentine vein in the Telluride conglomerate. And uh, 10 and a half million years ago, we finally have mineralization in the Camp Bird. So what that's suggesting is that the mineralization occurring in these northwest faults is completely unrelated to the mineralization occurring in this east-west Camp Bird Fault. Um, we also have uh, evidence mineralogically, distinctly different mineral assemblages and distinctly different ages. <clears throat> and uh, Camp Bird also had replacement ore, similar to the Argentine in the Telluride conglomerate, and that was dated at 10.2. So the replacement ore would have been located about right here, and the Camp Bird mineralization is along this fault. Right here you have mineralization at 10 million years, and right here you have mineralization at 17 million years. So pretty, even though they're relatively close in proximity, uh, entirely different sources. And uh, talk about the sources a little bit, just for the Camp Bird. There's a very minor quartz porphyry dike that cuts a number of these faults. It's dated about 10 million years ago. And that happens to coalesce with the 10 million year mineralization of the Camp Earth. So it suggests that there's a relationship there. <clears throat> uh, fluid inclusions, basically doing isotope studies, demonstrate that the ore fluids that uh, uh, carried the metals and ultimately became the, the vein itself uh, were derived from meteoric water. So that kind of is, is a little bit contrary to any kind of a porphyry system. Uh, we also have a, a diverse mixture of lead isotopes in the <clears throat> galena mineralization, which suggests that uh, the lead was sourced being rinsed out of the crustal rocks more so than the uh, than an underlying intrusive. Uh, so I guess the, the conclusion for a mineralization would be that uh, you know, the meteoric water 
came down the fractures, leached the wall rocks, but more importantly, uh, with respect to the gold mineralization, there's probably a relationship to that porphyritic intrusive that cuts these veins. So just to summarize that, uh, 27 million years ago, we think the Camper Fall formed. Um, sometime less than 17 million years ago, the Camper Fault was reactivated and displaced the younger Northwest Faults. And 10 million years ago, we have mineralization in the Camper. So exactly 9 million, 999,999 years later, <laughs> it's developed. <laughs> so the initial discovery of the camper vein actually occurred on these two claims right here. So this is that same geologic map, but zoomed in a little bit for scale. Uh, there's, it's probably really hard to tell from where you're sitting, but there's an aerial photo that's behind this. It's kind of draped behind it. So you can kind of see some of the surface features, but the three-level portal is right here, and that basically extends to the camper vein currently. Uh, however, in the early 1800s, this was the extent of the camper. They initially were developing it for silver. It didn't pan out, and uh, a fellow by the name of Tom Walsh, who had a smelting operation in Silverton, this is actually the Walsh smelter operating in Silverton, uh, he acquired the Uda load because it had a lot of quartz, and what the previous operators had considered the barren quartz. He did a little bit of work and uh, a little bit of assaying in geology and found out that, uh, in fact, it wasn't barren, and some of his samples ran $3,000 to the ton. And uh, he quietly, over the next several years, acquired additional claims surrounding the Camp Bird Main in the, in the area, a number of uh, accessory veins. And uh, over a six-year period, mined about uh, $350 million worth of present-day value gold, uh, 127,000 tons of uh, 1.6 ounces per ton. It's pretty impressive, <clears throat> even in the early days. Um, following 1902, he sold most of his interests to Camper Limited, which was an English company. And his uh, consideration for that sale was approximately six million dollars at that period of time. So his complete, uh, I would say, net proceeds from the Camp Bird totaled probably around the neighborhood of six hundred to seven hundred million dollars current day value. Um, this is a photo of Tom Walsh, and this is his daughter who, with some of the proceeds from the Camp Bird, purchased the Hope Diamond. <clears throat> In 1902, Camper Limited continued to mine in some of the upper levels of the Camper Vein uh, at Imogene Basin. This is a historic photo of the three-level portal. The vein actually is located over in the wall, but uh, you know, we're looking up into towards uh, Chicago Peak would be about right here. <clears throat> An old boarding house uh, was located right there. So just to kind of get a feel for the way the three-level is oriented, the portal comes in about right here, which is photographed right there, and then continues towards the vein. <clears throat> they mined, with Walsh's mining and this mining are about a million tons. Uh, 1916 to 1919, Camper Limited had trouble dewatering some of the uh, ore chutes, and so they decided to drive a tunnel at 14th, the middle level at that time, uh, to the Camper vein, about 11,000 foot long tunnel and intersect at 1,500 feet in, in elevation below the three level. Um, and this is a photo of actually 14 level, just as they were about to start developing uh, the tunnel towards Camp Bird. <clears throat> uh, by 1920, they did a little bit of drifting around and exploration, and they were pretty disappointed with the results at 14 level. Uh, they didn't find much gold down there relative to what they were finding up above. And so they closed the mine. Um, this is actually a photo of uh, uh, Camp Bird Limited miners at the time developing a drift in the Camp Bird. Um, and then in 1925, Camp Bird Leasing Company had a short stint of uh, leasing the mine and they worked also up at three level. Uh, and really, you know, the big production occurred between 29 and 56 under what was called King Leasing Corporate. 
and they developed the king scope initially at three level, and it continued all the way down to 14. And they didn't have drilling technology or the ability to look out several thousand feet in front of them at the time. So they would take around and make another decision and take around and make another decision, and they ultimately wound up developing it all the way down to 14 level. <clears throat> Uh, initially, their operations were solely uh, uh, based on high-grade gold, uh, gold mining, and after World War II, that basically transitioned to more of a base metals operation. And so their, their production during that period averaged about 800,000 tons of quarter ounce uh, of gold per ton, which is probably lower than it would be had they not transitioned to uh, base metals. <clears throat> and just for for fun. These photos are uh, from development in the King Stope, and they are pretty good pictures of what a shrink stope operation looks like. Uh, following the King Stope, or the, the King Leaks, uh, Camp Bird Limited took over again in 1956. Uh, they mined an additional 175,000 tons. This is a photo of their office building that they built at 14 level. And this was the mill, actually, 1940. That was the configuration. And if you guys uh, are familiar with the Camp Bird, the waste drop dump now continues much further beyond this. Um, 1960, they built a new mill at the 14 level. And uh, uh, it was primarily a flotation mill with a jig circuit. It had two float circuits. <clears throat> and in 1963, Federal Resources Corporation purchased the mine and operated more or less continuously until 1981. Uh, initially, they were developing the West Camp Bird and the Orphan Vein for, ba for base metals, and they did some exploration drilling into the Telluride conglomerate and found uh, some replacement ore, fairly significant replacement ore, at the contact of the Orphan Vein. And so they developed that with uh, what we refer to as the 8572 shaft, and this is the hoist that operated that shaft. Uh, the Telluride conglomerate, in case anybody isn't familiar, is photographed here. It's a uh, pretty bizarre unit, but what's unique about it for uh, replacing more deposition is it has a very calcareous uh, cement. So uh, under federal resources, you mined about a half a million tons and then shut the mine down. Um, in 1986, uh, Western Resources, which is now an affiliated or a uh, uh, subsidiary of BHP, and Royal Gold formed a joint venture to develop Camp Bird primarily for gold exploration and gold mining. Uh, they spent $18 million during that four year period. Uh, quite a bit of that was spent on upgrading the surface facilities, uh, but it was also uh, primarily spent on uh, developing the monument thing, and uh, that ended up being a disappointment. They actually didn't get the chance to focus on the Camp Bird vein, so it was largely untested. But when Royal uh, Western originally pulled out, and then Royal pulled out in 1990, they prepared a uh, more or less a summary report summarizing the production and exploration potential from their perspective of the Camp Bird vein. And this is just a longitudinal section of the vein itself, kind of a simplified version. The King Stope, uh, where we showed photos of before, is located right here. The 14 level is right there, the 3 level is right there, 1,500 feet between those two. And the number of stopes in between uh, the East and West Camp Bird. We refer to this as East Camp Bird because it essentially, from an infrastructure standpoint, is a separate mine than the West Camp Bird. Uh, 1990, and this is where Bob Oswald steps onto the scene. Uh, probably not back in 90, but this is basically the reclamation phase of the camper. Uh, between 1990 and 2012, uh, the mill was disassembled and shipped to Mongolia. That was in, I want to say, late 90s. Uh, the 14 level tunnel was caved, basically just abandoned, and that's what it looked like in 1999. And the surface disturbance associated with the Tailings disposal and the waste rock disposal was reclaimed to the, basically the extent of this photo here. <clears throat> and uh, as John mentioned, we came onto the scene uh, August and September of last year. 
So uh, the history of the camp bird, it can kind of basically be the production history in ways, can be summarized right here. We've got two and a half million tons and a million and a half ounces of gold, and uh, some significant other contributions from base metals and silver, but uh, primarily a gold producer. Um, <clears throat> and for those of you who are interested, this is the tram going from three level to 14 level. This is actually 14 level here on the surface. And uh, this is a photograph of uh, a wagon team taking concentrates from 14 level down to the right. Very neat. <laughs> so uh, September 24th, 2012 is kind of what we consider to be the beginning of a new era at the Camp Bird. Uh, this photo is representative of the reclaimed state uh, before we started activities. And uh, on September 24th, we began excavating the pond. So this is a large settling pond to handle the discharge water to basically allow time for suspended songs to fall out of suspension. Um, and that's basically it during a nearly completed phase. We put in a 36-inch HDP discharge pipe for about 900 linear feet from the portal to the pond. <clears throat> These are some of the historic houses that uh, the Camp Bird is probably most well known for. Uh, that's a completed photo of the pond, and that's actually a photo, I think, from Bob. Uh, either you or Wally took that. Yeah. I couldn't find any of a completed pond. I had to borrow from the state. <coughs> um, so that's, the, that's our, basically our water infrastructure is, is contained right there. Um, but as it flows out of the portal, we have a couple of head gates to uh, uh, manage the flow in the direction. We had to put a bridge over Imogene Creek. This is a photo of the discharge pipe. Um, and this is actually, if you recall, this is a photo from 99 of the collapsed portal. And this is what it looked like two months ago. So we excavated all around here, got to the brow and bedrock, and uh, had very confident ground. And uh, basically, uh, put in steel sets, we were putting in our initial steel set right there, and uh, walked it out for about, I want to say about 120 feet, and then did a backfill on top of that. And uh, the we don't have, I don't have a current photo, but basically we have bedded rail that comes out from here and connects to a surface shop that we built. This is actually the beginning stages of construction of that, we were just about done training it in. Um, it's an 8,000 square foot by 30 feet high shop, and it's going to serve as the dry, as well as you know, basically just a miscellaneous mine shop. So we'll have a second floor on this side, and that'll have offices, showers, locker rooms, etc., for the miners and the mine staff, and the rest of it will be uh, basically used for equipment storage and uh, supply storage. And that's a photo of it uh, completed. And basically, we're, we're just getting started going underground, but uh, most of our efforts since September have been to establish a surface infrastructure. A uh, number of things that weren't photographed uh, are not too exciting, or um, substation, you know, some of the more expensive, but uh, not very pretty to look at pictures. <clears throat> we're a couple minutes over. How oh. close are you? We're pretty close. Excited. Okay. We're excited to hear the future. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so again, this is a long section, and the, the, the point of this was basically to talk about the future development. Our plans right now are to develop the 14-level tunnel, uh, rehab it to the venting. We've got 11,000 feet to go. And then we have a, a, a number of vertical shafts that get us to 3-level. And then we'll rehab our way out from 3-level, which is about 2,500 feet. So. All together we have uh, oh, about uh, 15,000 feet of horizontal rehabilitation and probably about 2,500 feet of vertical rehabilitation. The blue dots that are represented on this are some of the near-term targets that uh, we'll be spending our uh, initial efforts on for, ex for production. And then we'll simultaneously be doing additional exploration on the margins of the vein where it was never explored. <coughs> Um, and this is basically just an organizational chart of Caldera, and hand it off to John real quick. Uh, I don't think I want to take any more time except to say thank you so much, and we've had a 
a terrific uh, a reception, and we appreciate all of the great, uh, um, great wishes of goodwill we've gotten from the whole community. I tell you, it's been a really great, great pleasure, and we're delighted to be here.